Uh, hi there. How are you doing? Hello. Hello. How are you? Uh, very good. Very good today. I'm sorry I couldn't show up as a monkey, but uh, I'm sure your talk is way better than me as a monkey. So. <laughs> I hope you notice I, I'm, I'm prepared. I have a special t-shirt already. Oh, oh uh, I, I, I love that. Could you stand? Yeah. That, nice. That yeah, is, I, I got it from Martin. So thanks again for it. <laughs> yeah. Martin runs a t-shirt shop on the side. So yeah. <laughs> that's, that's how he supplements his pay. <laughs> yeah, but the price was really good. So that, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, you can't beat free. Uh, no, that's actually one of my favorite JetBrains design T-shirts. It's uh, so cool. Uh, I love space, so uh, it's yeah. one of those things that is very cool. But, so, Roman, yeah. what got you into this with in like computing with environmental concerns? I have to say, despite being somebody who's interested in helping the environment, I have mostly and largely ignored it as it applies to software and until I heard about cryptocurrency and how just, oh, the amount of energy and resources it takes. And then still was kind of like, well, that's them over there. Not so much a .NET developer, but maybe it's not the case, right? That's what you're going to talk about today. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, this time it's, it's uh, uh, I, I would say that the impact is, is pretty huge. And uh, oh. when I will explain uh, how we did it and why we did it, uh, I'm pretty proud of this work for, for our team. And uh, I never thought I will be ever a fan of nautical transport. So now, now I am. So it's it's good that you can you can combine it because if you look at this vessels and ships on, on the sea, they are really like huge monsters uh, taking a lot of lot of fuel and a lot of uh, producing a lot of, lot of carbon pr uh, footprint. So uh, yeah, that's 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 good that that we did it. And and uh, during my talk, I'll be more than uh, happy to show you how we did it. Actually, the goal of this talk is to uh, show the other developers, not only on necessary f -sharp, but all the other .NET developers, how they can create their very own service to uh, do something like we did. So uh, Awesome. Uh, well, on that note, let's give you the stage. I'm going to share your screen, and then uh, Rachel and I will drop off. We'll be here. If you need anything, let us know. But uh, the stage is yours. Good luck. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, hello again. Uh, welcome to my uh, talk about F Sharp, about serverless, about nautical transport. Uh, first of all, I need to say I'm a big fan of uh, JetBrains and uh, a big fan of Rider. We nearly like put it uh, everywhere in our .NET department. So thanks again for for having me. And today uh, I'll be showing you a little more about what we did. Uh, if you ever are on Twitter on the uh, F Sharp community, I um, think you already a little bit know me. I work in Prague in a company called CN Group. I work here as a principal technical lead for .NET. I'm the founder of Czech F Sharp community called F Sharping, which is now sort of like sleeping after COVID, but we will we will come back <laughs> one day. And uh, I'm a big fan of F Sharp, obviously. So uh, let me tell you a story. Uh, about F Sharp and nautical transport. First of all, uh, it all starts with our customer. Uh, if you are uh, from, let's say, northern part of the Europe, you all probably already heard about a company called Stenaline, which is a Swedish company. It's one of the largest uh, ferry operator in the world. It was founded in 1962 and it operates vessel on North Sea, Baltic Sea, Arctic Sea. If you look at their um, Roads, they are now operating on 17 roads with uh, more than 25,000 total ceilings. And their fleet size, which is, I would say, pretty important, fleet size is now uh, 37 vessels. And if you look at the vessel, really like description of the vessel, you can see it on my screen that, for example, it, it, this, this is, I think, a Stena Germanica which is pretty huge. And uh, these long monsters with a lot of engine power and uh, with the capacity to, for example, get 300 cars inside or uh, more than 1,000 passengers, um, they are massive beasts. And they produce a lot of uh, CO2 emissions and the, the amount of it is really non-trivial. So Stenaline decided to create something uh, which they call fuel pilot. They decided they they want to 
uh, bring down the fuel consumption and reduce CO emissions uh, by tens of the percent till I think it's 2028 is the final date, if I remember it correctly, when uh, we should get to the, let's say, most uh, fuel fuel savings and, uh, of course, CO2 emission savings. And to do so, they uh, use something which is running on the vessel, vessel itself. It's called uh, Fuel Pilot, which is a software that's running on officer's bridge. And this is AI assistant, which combines more nautical data or let's say more data streams like nautical expertise, weather data sources. Of course, it uses those timetables and it also uses special vessel characteristics. It all brings together to this very fancy AI stuff. And once the vessel leaves the port, um, it takes over the control of the vessel itself and uh, calculates the best roads and you know engine powers and stuff like that. I, I think there are many many sensors on the vessel itself, so it's able to you know drown itself a little bit or get get higher. It's really really high tech stuff. Uh, I've been there once, and uh, our role, like my F sharp team in here, was to uh, to produce or, or to help to send the weather forecast to this vessel. And um, if you look at the forecast providers currently on the market, there are many free, for example, Copernicus, the free service you can take and you can start using its own data for your own good. There are Finnish Meteorological Institute, Norwegian one, Danish one. Uh, all of those are necessary for fuel pilot to be fully functional. And uh, it started a little bit sooner before our team uh, from the, the F-Sharp part uh, joined in. And previously, before the weather service, it was that each of the vessel um, on its own called those uh, forecast providers and asked about uh, what's the weather here and what's the weather next hour there and stuff like that. And if you if you think about it, I don't, I don't know if you ever uh, been to the vessels, uh, you see with your mobile phone, but the satellite connection, it's really slow in there. And at some points on map, there are really nearly none. And it's also very expensive. So there was missing some, let's call it central point of intelligence for providing these kind of data to the vessels. So this is how Stena Weather Service was born. And this is where our uh, F-Sharp team join in and start creating something which helps them to to uh, reduce the environment and footprint really, really a lot. Um, if you look at it, let's say from the perspective of the vessel, there's one central point. Uh, the goal of all of it was to create cloud-based solutions so we don't have to care of uh, many things. And goal of uh, this service was to, first of all, aggregate the forecasts from different providers, from those I mentioned, like Copernicus, Danish, Norwegian, but uh, also doing uh, advanced calculations because sometimes there are points on map when you don't have the weather and you need to calculate it and simply behave as a single point of truth for vessels and of course handling some you know transient errors and stuff like that. So for you as a uh, listeners here, uh, for the audience, I created really dramatic version of how does it work. But don't worry, once this is done, uh, we will get also to the technical details. So uh, stay with me. So first of all, it starts that Wessel, Wessel initiates the session like, what's up, bro? And the weather service replies, what's up? And the Wessel says, look, uh, I want to go from Kiel to Gothenburg and I need wind at 10 meters and also some wave forecast and sailing starts at 10 a.m. And I will use this timetable with this GPS position as my route. So you go and you find the best providers, right? And Stena Weather Service replies, sure, bro. And here's your token, ABC, one, two, three, X, Y, Z and some already cached values from database, but you can ask me later for update. And meanwhile, I'm gonna go back to my background services and uh, I'll, I'll ask my providers about the newer forecast. So this is how the better service works in the, let's say, initial phase. After a while, let's say, uh, Wessel is on the sea, it it flew, I don't know, it, it went some, some kilometers and, or <laughs> nautical miles, uh, of course, and say, Hey, bro, 
Yeah, what's up? Um, is there any update on forecast for my sailing since the token you sent me was created? And the weather service replies, yeah, here are some fresh values. So um, I'm sending you just diff so you can save some satellite payload as well since we are saving uh, what we can. And by the way, here's your newer token, CDE456XYZ. So next time you ask me about the diff, you will use this one, right? And the uh, vessel replies, thanks, you have sharp people. You just rock. And 400 wet requests. What? Uh, never mind. Just kidding. So that was, that was, I would say, a dramatic version. But uh, this is technical conference. So let's get into some, let's say, more technical details. So how does it really work? So first of all, uh, what weather service does, it checks for which forecast providers which part of the route is covered. You can see it on a picture that some, we call them models in, in the forecast um, uh, way of thinking and talking. Uh, these models cover some parts of the map with some, uh, with some data, with, with, with some uh, uh, data. Yeah. And uh, weather service checks if the road is covered from which part. And of course, if there's any new forecast available, so in other words, I would say it ask like, who should we ask for the data on the road? And is it even necessary to ask now? Because of course, some forecasts are calculated uh, during time. Some are calculated, I don't know, every six hours, sometimes every 12 hours. So also it needs to be aware that uh, it's, it's worth to ask. Then uh, weather service ask in parallel, which is really important, each provider for the part of the route. For example, here to Danish Meteorological Institute, give me within 10 meters for this uh, longitude latitude. The same for Copernicus, probably different part of the route for uh, Norwegian. Then sometimes uh, when the providers respond back, now we are getting to this uh, transient errors, um, we store uh, the data uh, in an immutable way, uh, like keeping in in mind, I will get to it later, uh, store it in immutable way in the Cosmos DB. And when the vessel asks for forecasts, uh, it looks in the uh, NoSQL database in the Cosmos DB at trimming of already passed waypoints because there's no reason to send you data for the part of the route which vessel is already behind and compares the data from the previous forecast. And in case there is no diff, it just uh, sends 204 no content or it sends the dip. As I said, sometimes uh, uh, we don't have all the data. Sometimes if you ask for providers for some forecast, um, we have, we call it holes in the data where the weather service tries to interpolate the missing values. Uh, we use vector interpolation for wind and current, uh, scalar for waves. And interpolation happens both in time and space. So for example, we are able to somehow guess or calculate if there's something missing that uh, if it's like one hour and I don't know, 10 nautical miles away that we are able to calculate. Of course, uh, you need to stop it somewhere. Otherwise you would end up, for example, in 100 waves uh, on shore, which is not really correct. Um, so there are some limitation, but I think this is pretty important. Finally, we have uh, some uh, math for F sharp. So finally, we are using uh, F sharp for some math. So good, and it works well. Overall, like I'm pretty pretty happy about uh, how the service behaves, and uh, Stena decided to uh, apply to more and more vessels. So I would say in the long term, all 37 out of 37 vessels should should be using this to save more and more fuel and to be more the mass, like most effective as, as possible. Um, so I, I would say now it's time for, I call lessons learned, uh, things I wish I knew two years ago, because as I said from, uh, in the very beginning, goal of this talk to give you all the different aspects of the knowledge I and my team, we gathered uh, during the last few years working on this. So. What I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll be very open here. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'll be really sharing uh, whatever I know. And 
my goal is to tell you what work, what not, to give you some practical tip and, uh, tips and hints, uh, like from text tech, domain modeling, how we did the error handling, data storage, monitoring, scaling, sterilization, everything. So goal of this is that you will be able to create your very own weather service. And hopefully I wish you all the best that you don't repeat our stupid mistakes. So first thing, uh, let's start with the tech stack. And uh, of course, of course, uh, if you know me, uh, the tech stack uh, means that it will be modern, it will be Azure and it will be F sharp. So uh, infrastructure we are running on Azure cloud. The main language at the time was uh, F-Sharp with .NET Core 3.1. Now it's migrated to the .NET 6. For API, we used ASP.NET with Giraffe, typical, I would say, uh, go-to library for, for F-Sharp server. And for background processing, we used Azure Functions and App Service for containers. I will get to it in more deep. And for the storages, we used Cosmos DB, table storage, blob storage, but again, I will get to it in more deep. First thing I would say, if you want to start something like that, if you want to create something like that, is to domain modeling. Step number one, you need to model your domain. And this is the part where whenever this is the first time you as a .NET developers are hearing about F-Sharp or you already know, this is always the best selling point for F-Sharp because this is where it really shines. Because uh, using uh, union types, which are a really great way how to model the domain uh, with combination uh, with record that you can uh, note here that we are not really like consistent with uh, with the, um, the code convention, but we call it punk. And uh, combination of those, it's really, really powerful for defining in an easy way in just a few lines of code what the whole service will be uh, about. If you are more familiar with F-Sharp, you're probably asking, hey, and what about unit of measures? So I need to say, uh, we didn't use them, but looking back, uh, I would definitely involve them. But in that time we said, okay, let's not use the unit for measures to distinguish between degrees and meters and seconds and meters per second, stuff like that. Um, but uh, overall, I would say looking back, I would, I would recommend to uh, also use unit of measures. Um, as I said, uh, F-Sharp is extremely good for domain modeling. You can use uh, option type instead of null. And uh, what is really, really great, and this is like one hint, I would say that, uh, for example, naming modules, same as the types, uh, will give you nice, I would say, OOP feeling. So you have the functions related to some data uh, or some type. They are accessible via uh, dot sign. So, whenever you want to use some function which belongs to this type, they are, they are not together, but they look like they are together. So this is, this is, this is pretty cool. And uh, I will just give you a little warning, only the universal function should be part of the domain. Everything else should just go to the extension place where it belongs to. But I would say um, this combination for domain model is, is, is pretty, pretty good. I would be repeated a lot of set things about F sharp and domain modeling. Uh, in here, I will do, I would say like uh, step, um, sidestep uh, to the same topic, but different project. I would definitely recommend to look at what uh, James Randall did with F sharp Wolfenstein, who just rewrote Wolfenstein in F sharp. And why the reason why I'm saying that is that uh, James tried to do the same with C sharp and Blazor. And this is really, really, uh, hilarious uh, to read his blog post about how he's struggling when once you get the domain modeling in your head in F sharp, how difficult it is to do it in C sharp if you don't have this union types. It's right. Really, it's really like mind bending. Uh, so I totally, totally recommend to look at this and you will then probably more understand why this is so cool, why F sharpers are still, there are broken records still to get, oh, oh union types, union types, that's why. Just look at the link and, and you will you will get it. It's it's really, really, really good stuff. So nice, uh, we have a domain and now we should get some data from forecast providers, right? Um, usually you have two options how to get data from any forecast provider. Typically it's REST API or, and this is the, I would say most funny part, something which is called NetCDF file. 
And I will skip most of the part of REST API because uh, I would say that all of you are working on daily basis with REST APIs. There's nothing really fancy, but maybe you can have a look at the code and you see, oh, how nice it works together if you want to do the functional composition with the composition operator. So I can create really nice way how to create HTTP request, for example, combining these nice functions. That's cool. Uh, but I would otherwise say that like uh, there's nothing to surprise such an advanced audience. So let's move to something different. And I would say NetCDF is a different beast. First of all, um, it's originally based on common data format by NASA. And then when there's somewhere mentioned NASA, then you know it's going to be fun. It was produced and maintained by uh, UCAR in Boulder in Colorado. And uh, somehow it became the standard way of sharing data between data scientists and the other strange people. Um, if you look inside how data are stored, they are stored in matrices called variables. And those matrices can be sliced usually by another variable. So for example, if you uh, want to slice the data by some time frame or some date or some time, you can, you can, you can do it. And the uh, whole purpose of this design is to store as much data as possible uh, with the lowest volume size as possible. So really, this is pretty, pretty, uh, I would say, advanced and amazing stuff. And uh, if you look at the each variable, uh, you can gather information like the what's the actual fill value, which is uh, just a synonym for not present value. What's the name of the variable? What are the units? Is it the meters or seconds or what's actually inside? It's it's so generic that you can store uh, nearly anything there so that's that's pretty cool and um if you look just on let's say one slice of the data and i'll show you uh later uh you see that there's some variable there's some uh the slices of the cube I will, you, can, you can have a look at it as a, as a cube of the data and for example in this uh example uh, you have latitude and longitude access. You have those holes. As I said, there are sometimes there are no data. Or if you are really, really lucky, you finally are able to read some single value for some latitude and longitude at some certain point of time. And this is where you are starting to keep being really happy because you have finally something to, to read from. And um, if, you ever, if you ever wanted to have a look at these NetCDF files, I totally recommend something which is called Panoply. It's free application. I think it's Java, it's Java based. Uh, you download it, you run it, and you can dig deeper into this NetCDF files and uh, looking also having some graphs and, and visualization and stuff like that, which is pretty cool. But um, we are programmers, right? So we want to work with these kind of data in more programmatic way. And I need to say it out loud, uh, as a .NET developers, uh, we are kind of screwed in this scenario. Because if you look at what we normally do as a .NET developers, those uh, line of business application, when we write into the some tables, reading from some tables, so still the same. But for, uh, let's say, for the um, more advanced stuff, there's C, C++, Java, Fortran, Ruby, MATLAB. There are way more options, Python. <laughs> uh, but for .NET, if you, for example, want to read NetCDF files, uh, you are nearly with no option. Luckily, there's one guy uh, called Vasily Lutsarev uh, who wrote probably the, the only one existing .NET library for NetCDF file, which is pretty cool. You can you can uh, download it here from the GitHub. You can can fork it on, uh, or you can get it from NuGet. It's called SDS Slide, and thanks to this amazingly smart, really gentleman, uh, you are able to read, uh, or we are able to read NetCDF files in a nicer uh, nicer way. Uh, I would say, and I'll show you right now in demo, that uh, thanks to the F-sharp, you can wrap it whole um, library 
in really nice way that you can read data including scale factor and offset and missing value and then you can read it in more functional way so uh, again here it was just like like nearly 200 lines of code of f sharp wrapping this library and we were able to uh to work it uh, work with it really really nicely so i'll show you right now first of all like i will show you uh, this is the panoply and just an example that I'm looking at the some netcdf file where we have for example spectral significant wave height this is one of the information we are interested in and I will just look uh, inside and here as I said you can just zoom in so you will see maybe if if it works uh, no one second Ah, here we go. Perfect. So you can zoom in, you can see the visualization of the data, but what's more important, you can see here the data, which are here, of course, not available uh, for some space, but here they are. I need to switch it to full representation of the data. So you will see it as it is. And I will switch to the indexes. So for example, I will uh, have a look at this index i remember it's third 310 in other words it's this latitude i will not read again and this this longitude and uh when i switch to my beloved uh jetbrains writer uh first of all i will show you here's the library from Vasily. you just open the data set which is now uh, laying on my temp and first of all, you can print all variables inside. You can just, just go through. Then uh, you can have a look at the variable, which is the name VHM0, which is the name uh, you have it here. And then finally, you are able to extract some value on some index. For example, here I will show you that uh, on this three zero indexes, you will get an empty value or aka called fill value, or I can read exactly the data from uh, this index. So I will run it quickly. And uh, luckily, <clears throat> I'll be able to show you the data. Perfect. So first of all, if I look here, you see that here are what are the variables, as I promised. Here is the empty value. And if you look at here, the sum value is uh, 0.65203636369. So if you look here, it should be, I will, oh, oh, come on, I will switch back to the, yes. So 65203637, so it's rounded. So just for you to, to have a, to have an understanding how data are at, as you see, here it's just 25 lines of the code the the library itself it's 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 pretty nice you just need to get used to the fact that you are reading data from multi-dimensional metrics so so you need to you need to know what kind of dimensions are there and what are the data that you are expecting to read but otherwise thanks thanks to uh Vasily, we are able to able to read it as i said uh we are actually reading from huh, two uh, data sets at the very same time, because if you notice, it was just, a, uh, let's say one value, it was the X value, but also you need to read a different variable from the same file, from the same time, from the same GPS. Uh, so then it's really starting even more funny. Uh, so you have to read from two variables to get full data, and then you need to convert it again, luckily, uh, Finally, some F sharp uh, and math together. We'll just convert it from something we call, call vector 2D to the uh, vector with the, some direction and with some size. So that's how we read NetCDF file. Uh, again, uh, have a look at this library if you want to try on your own. It's it's pretty powerful and it's actually, unfortunately, the only choice you have on, on .NET. So sorry about that. Okay, so now we have a data and where to pull them. As I said from the very beginning, we chose a Cosmos DB uh, because, frankly speaking, it's one of the most powerful NoSQL databases on Azure. It's, it's pretty pretty cool with different you know tweaks and 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 uh, for example the consistency levels stuff like that. Uh, I just want to warn you a little bit that it's really really fast, great availability, it's amazing stuff, but 
but really if you do it wrong it can be expensive as hell and i'm the guy who created instance uh for a few thousands of euros per month luckily nobody noticed on different projects it wasn't on this uh but just i'm warning you i i burn my fingers a lot uh like cosmos db is great but be aware of that there are some pricing implications what really worked well and if you remember we said that uh, we provide data to the vessels as a diff so where really uh, i would say functional approach worked is the immutable approach it means that we store every data we get and uh, because of we don't mutate anything it's fast it's reliable we just calculate the state based on the needs and you probably said to yourself oh you just mentioned that cosmos db is expensive and you are just storing everything you are not like overriding nothing so there will be a lot of data at some time you are right yes they are a lot of data stored in this database but luckily and uh that's what that's another lessons learned for you if you ever trying to build something uh, similar is that uh, luckily there's uh, ttl or time to live uh, for automatic cleanup of those these data so you either set it on record level or you either set it on whole data collection level but what's really great that cosmos db utilize those free request units when it's in idle state and just deletes the all data for you so you just say okay i'm going to store this weather forecast information just a simple json and i will keep it alive for two days and after two days i just want to get rid of it there's probably no reason why would i store uh historical data anyway uh so because they are always available you can go to the copernicus and get the weather uh, like five years ago so there's there's no reason to do that and it's also again really uh really effective because it's done automatically on the database level um another really great uh storage as a table storage is part of something which is called uh, storage account and we use it for some very specific scenarios but i would really if you never heard about it i would totally uh like recommend it to try it because it's amazingly cheap there are some limits don't think about some deep queries inside and stuff like that don't even think about accessing data without having partition and row key but uh, otherwise it's cheap it's pretty fast and for example again i can recommend a great talk by troy hunt who uh, wrote his have i been pound.com service based on table storage and as far as i know it costs him about i don't know like two coffees per month something like that about i don't know 30 dollars or 20 dollars or something like that for i would say billions of records because his database is pretty huge and it's everything built on the table storage so i would totally recommend and again it's it's the way how we should build the software we should think about not having one database for everything but to choose the correct service for the correct scenario actually for me this is what the domain driven development is actually about so uh, give it a try and now we are getting to my favorite part which is the serialization because uh this is the part where we did a lot of mistakes and i did a lot of mistakes uh first of all if i if there will be one thing i would really recommend you is never ever serialize union types as they are uh you know union types from the domain modeling part of this presentation those enums on drugs as we call them they are really great they are powerful but never ever serialize them if you will be reading them from different part than f sharp again because for example uh looking here this is how we did it we serialized the union type for the win at 10 meters you already know from the domain driven part that that's a domain modeling part that there's some direction there's some speed nothing bad here actually but if you want to read it uh, from the cosmos db query you need to use this crazy function like is object and otherwise this is like it's, it's not so bad but it can it can be really ugly in, in short time so what i would totally suggest and recommend please instead of storing it as it is uh, use special property some discriminator to find out which of the union case it is and then uh, have the data 
So when you, for example, want to read all the win and tent meters data you have in the database, you can do this nicely, uh, self-explanatory SQL, and you will get data in really quick, uh, qu qu quick time. So, so this is this is something I would totally recommend. Please, please, uh, never store it as it is. Another thing uh, about the serialization, and this is where I need to uh, quote uh, Einar Holst, who said, I hate configuring JSON serializers. I'm totally uh, with him on it. Uh, for us, this configuration has 396 lines of code. I put a note here, uh, I know, and it's really huge. So please, again, avoid the magic, be explicit about the conversion and uh, really, if there's no magic, there's nothing to surprise you. Even if sometimes it's more manual work, please, it's so tempting to add more and more and more converters and more auto magic stuff. But after some time, it will bite you back. And again, I will I will recommend to going to these two uh, amazing uh, blog posts about how actually serialization, which sounds really easy, like I put mutants of JSON and that's it, right? But how complex it, it can be and how difficult it is to be uh, correct in serialization way and not even speaking about when you involve some strange things like F-sharp and union types and records and tuples and stuff like that. So, so uh, definitely be aware and think about it deeply before you just step in uh, with some tools you already are used to uh, work with. Um, we slightly touched it, uh, but Let's talk more about how we actually get the data because now we have the data, we have them stored, everything is nice. We probably fixed the serialization. So let's talk about the background jobs. And first of all, I would say that there are two parts, two kind of services we use in this project. First is up service for containers. Second one is Azure Functions. This is where the serverless part from the, from the title goes. And up services for containers, mm, they are good, nothing against them. We use them also on other other projects. But uh, initially we were thinking about using only Azure functions. And um, for just, just to be total open with you, and I promise I will be total open with you in here, as the reason why we involve up service for, for containers is that we had to do grip to to net CDF conversion, which is, as I said, also like terrible stuff. And again, there's no library able to do that on .NET. So what we actually do is we do the conversion with Java and then we read the net CDF files. And to do that, you need to involve dependencies which are not possible to do in typical Azure functions. So we have to really create own Docker container with own dependencies with the Java installed and stuff like that. So this is good that for if you want to do something on background, which is something not conventional, you can just uh, use Docker and put it uh, into app service for containers as a, as a background job and it works pretty nicely. I think in the long term, maybe it can be replaced with Azure functions uh, in the custom worker in isolated process way where you are able to bring more dependencies. Uh, so probably in future we will rewrite it. But uh, just for you to tell you how, how we get to the app service for containers. Azure functions. Ah, this is this is my favorite part. I love them. I need to say as as much as I <laughs> love uh, Rider as an idea, then I like uh, Azure Functions as a way how to write and how to deploy and how to run code in cloud because it's it's amazing. Uh, if you ever wrote a uh, red book uh, from Sam Newman about the microservices, actually, I think it's the first chapter when uh, Sam says, uh, if you're thinking about doing microservices, maybe put it into the functions first, and later on, maybe you will have more need to move it to the Docker's or Kubernetes, but functions are really like, I would say, uh, you know, gateway drug to splitting functionality based on some domain and ba based on some functionality uh, area and contexts and and and, write, uh, and run it in, in uh, cloud. So it's it's pretty great. First of all, it's a great pricing. I totally recommend it. I think like 1 million invocations are for free. Um, you can use various triggers like uh, cron time-based, HTTP requests, queues, event grid, stuff like that. 
and it has amazing scaling uh, possibilities and also built-in retries, which is pretty cool. And again, as I said, I'll be totally open. I need to warn you about two things. First of all, those who, the hosts that are running this Azure Functions are really weak. So if you are thinking about, I don't know, doing some advanced calculation or something really performance heavy, forget about it. You can't do it on consumption level on Azure Functions because those hosts are just, just weak. And second thing is if you thinking about having Azure Functions as a backend instead of, for example, ASP.NET for some web application, and I try that, uh, be aware that uh, the cold starts can take up to, I don't know, 12, 14, 15 seconds sometimes. So it's it's not really fancy stuff for, uh, for customer facing some API waiting for 12 seconds when the function wake up. But otherwise for background stuff, it's it's amazing. And what I like, uh, I don't know if you if you are using the old style or new style, but in the in just like one hint for me here is that you can treat uh, the serverless host like an ASP.NET host regarding dependency injection. So you can uh, register your own dependencies here, you know, typical DI container at Singleton and stuff like that. Uh, if you will use the new way of writing Azure Functions with the isolated process, uh, the code looks slightly different, but the logic still applies that, that you can just uh, put in some uh, dependency and then you will just wrap it in class with some constructor and uh, use automatically injected uh, dependencies. This is like one thing that you will probably will need if you will write functions in, in uh, some more serious way. And it's good that it's totally possible. Um, I mentioned retries. They are pretty, pretty powerful. Uh, I think by default, there are five retries, but you can use something you are, or I suggest uh, aware of uh, from Polly, where you can use different behavior for handling this transient error. So for example, you can have uh, exponential back off retry, you can have fixed delay retries or just fixed retries. It's up to you which one you will decide, but it's it's, it's uh, supported uh, by by Azure Functions. So you just put it as a, an, another attribute, put some values in there and you're good to go, which is, which is pretty, pretty, pretty great. And uh, when I set two kind of Azure Functions, uh, yeah, to make things a little bit harder, there are actually two ways of uh, how to run Azure Functions in cloud. First one is the old one, which is called in-process. And second one is the future, which is called the isolated process. And briefly to explain how they differ, uh, instead of building .NET like library loaded by Azure host, you build a .NET console application that you reference and worker SDKs. So you have full control over the application startup and dependencies consumes and stuff like that. In weather service, uh, we have all our functions in the old way. And uh, I think we will need to upgrade soon later to the newer one. Maybe then we will revisit the using the app, app service for containers again. But uh, just for you to, to be aware that uh, Azure functions are really, really great stuff for background processing. But if you are going to jump in right now, just go for, I would say, isolated process. Okay, so we have an application. We have a background jobs getting data. Everything is cor correctly serialized. Now it's time to think about how to scale. And again, as I said, I'll be sharing everything. First thing I would like to share with you is to, you need to know your enemy to properly scale. You need to understand how and where are the expected peaks. For example, in this domain, in this business, if we are talking about weather forecast, you need to know at what time of the day forecast providers uh, update recalculates the forecast. You need to read the documentation. You need to get the information. You need to understanding what kind of beast you are dealing with. And one thing you need to know that peaks in the background processing uh, can totally occur in different time than API peaks, that something is happening on the background that can have totally different um, reason behind than API peaks, which are treated by, uh, like created by your by your users or by the consumers working with, with your API. So one of the things that work well, 
And uh, before this project, I never used it before. And then I realized how how good it actually works is the scaling based on service bus. I think you already know scaling based on CPU usage, stuff like that. But scaling based on the amount of the messages waiting at some queue, uh, it's pretty great. For, for example, in our case, we have standalone service for par parsing those crazy NetCDF files I'll be showing you. And we set on up service, we get scaling that uh, should scale horizontally based on the amount of the messages that are waiting in queue. So when there are too many of them waiting and we just need to, you know, move a little bit, uh, then it scales to handle the load and starts parsing. And when the parsing is over, when the peak or the background is over, it just scales down. It's pretty easy to set up, just a few clicks. You just need to more think about what's the root cause of the peak, not how to handle it. And uh, totally, I, I, I recommend to, to play with it in up service menu. For the those API-based peaks, because one thing is that, okay, we are loaded on background, but now the vessels are on C and asking and asking and asking for more updates. Um, uh, there's different way how to handle it. This is where we are getting to, I would say, good old scaling based on CPU usage. And uh, this is like, I would say, normal normal stuff so nothing nothing fancy here just a really similar to what i showed you for service bus it's just a different metrics um azure functions and this is uh again the power and the beauty of the serverless uh scale really well and they scale sometimes so well that you need to you know uh choke it a little bit uh like we did for example here with the service bus trigger uh, because again, as I said, we are using Cosmos DB and when you are working with Cosmos DB, you can pretty easily get to something which is called HTTP 429 error, which means that, oh, you are say, saving or reading, you're just, this load is too big, like wait, wait for a few seconds. So to avoiding these uh, errors, you have two options. First one is, okay, I will set up, I don't know, 10,000 or 100,000 request units, and then my credit card will burn. <laughs> uh, or I can, because I'm, I'm handling background data, and I know that it doesn't matter if I write it in the database now or a few minutes later, when the calculation of the weather forecast is only every 12 hours. So it doesn't really make sense to, to, to like push it, push it harder into database. So you can use uh, host JSON to control the scaling based on trigger type. So this was for me again. I never used it before, and it's pretty cool that you can say, okay, for uh, the service bus, I just want maximum concurrent functions to be triggered by this this uh, like uh, by, by this trigger, and you are able to tweak it and and choke it a little bit on the Azure function uh, scaling setup. So that's 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 pretty cool, and you don't have to pay more money for a more powerful database if you don't care that you will get data a little bit later. Of course, as I said, you can set up a maximum request units and, and uh, uh, let it auto-scale. Um, just for you, uh, auto-scale is really good, but you need to know that on Cosmos DB, you pay minimum of 10% of maximum request units whenever it's happening, even if it's idle state. So, uh, Again, big warning here, uh, think about it wisely. Uh, you can let the Cosmos scale from 10 to 100%, definitely, but think about it that even if nothing is happening, you'll pay 10% of maximum resource unit. So uh, that's that's one thing regarding scaling database. Um, no matter how well we do scaling, errors always happen. I'm sorry, it's just, uh, I, I, I think Rachel and Khalid said it uh, before my talk that uh, there's never ever uh, fully functional software, so error handling is always there. And I just want to, to show you a little bit how we approach the error handling in our application. Uh, first of all, uh, you need to know what's going on. So you need to, again, define a well-structured discriminated union for the errors when you say, okay, these are the kind of errors I expect to be appearing in my application. I don't like it, but they are there. So let's give them some fancy types. And what we did is that we combine these errors with like 
result types with exceptions. We combine exception with result types, actually. Uh, so we uh, wrap this kind of error in the something we call service exception, and we just use it as a transfer layer. We wrote few short, you see just, just a few lines of code, a few short functions for throwing this well-defined error wrapped in exception, just something like, Okay, now you can like fail, but inside with with fancy error as a payload, and then uh, we we combine it uh, on the task level uh, with all typical result types because result, if you never heard about it, something like uh, instead of throwing an error, some application or some libraries are throwing result, which says, okay, did it work? Yes, no. True, false, and these are uh, this. This is this is what what our data uh, related to the result of the <laughs> of the result, and uh, we just did uh, a little bit hacking where we said, okay, you know what, task is impure by definition. Let's avoid of task results, async results, task results options, and binding things together. Let's avoid all the functionality madness. Let's be reasonable here. So instead of really combining different kind of results. And when it's getting to the asynchronous stuff, it's getting really ugly. Otherwise, results are good. Then instead of that, just follow two simple rules. Those exceptions can be thrown only from the top impure level. And those exceptions should always uh, contain this, this error. So um, so then we are able to, is I call it, escape the monad uh, pretty quickly. So instead of like, combining still the result, the result, the result. We just say, okay, if this is false or this is bad result, uh, I will just throw an exception, but well-defined exception. On this topic, uh, I did a lightning talk, uh, I think it was last year, uh, oh, time flies, on a, a F-sharp exchange conference uh, about uh, exactly explaining how this works, how we did it. So I'll just will not repeat myself, but there's, uh, there's uh, I would say a heretic talk explaining that the result is always not the best thing you want to use. All right. So we have everything together. And last thing uh, is to monitor what's going on, right? So for us, what uh, worked very really well, I would say this is something you will end up using if you go blindly to Azure and just grab something, which is the first offering, is Application Insights. And I would recommend to start with it. I know there are some open telemetry. There are way more options how to do it. But uh, for us, we just say, okay, let's take this go-to solution in Azure Cloud and we will see how it goes. And it went well. Uh, you have application map. You have live logs. You are able to trace the failures over more services. So there are some correlation, uh, correlation ID behind. So you are able to track the calls between services and between servers. That's, that's pretty cool. And uh, you are able to get the email alert. So whenever the application is down, hopefully not right now, then you will just get the alert and everything is usually one click configuration. Just, I will not spend so many time here, but uh, just uh, uh, maybe one warning again regarding the pricing. Um, watch out for data retention, data sampling and ingestion, uh, because again, it can be pretty expensive. Uh, if you don't think about it, you know, typical like, oh, let's uh, lock everything. Then you get a first bill and then you say, oh, let's not lock just everything. And you need to think about it more deep. So uh, it's the same. Like cloud is amazing. I just read the yesterday article uh, from the hey.com that they are leaving cloud. And I say, look, like cloud is great if you know how to use it. Can be expensive if you don't know how to use it uh, or if you do stupid mistakes like we did. But uh, otherwise, like if you are reasonable about uh, tweaking the, the the services configuration, it's 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 pretty pretty good. Um, this is the part I call boring stuff. The final part of my presentation. It's boring because of just works and but to complete the picture of service itself, I, I need to tell you uh, what we what we used. First of all, uh, I would start from the middle. The applic uh, app service with Giraffe. It works so easy. It's so predictable. It's nearly boring, uh, actually. It's if you work with Jira, which is functional wrapper over ASP.NET, which making all the composition of the handlers more elegant, more sexy, more more functional. It's something that it 
will become boring at, at some time because it's it's just bricks. It's really great. Uh, for service bus, it's just a bus. Of course, you can use different kind of messaging. You can use queues on the storage account. You can uh, uh, use Rabbit and queue. Why not? But we just use serving service bus, and it works well, especially because of their are support on Azure Functions for the different triggers and stuff like that. And it works pretty, you know, predictable. So it's good for the authentication stuff uh, between the vessels and weather service. We use uh, Azure AD. So again, like uh, it works without any problem. But there's also fun stuff which is the weather service UI. And this is where I would like to all, if you are still not into F sharp yet, you say, oh, look, I'm more into the front end. Then uh, I have a good news for you. Uh, because we were asked during autumn next year uh, to create for already existing backend service, backend only service, uh, to create UI layer uh, showing you know maps and roads and tables, stuff like that. Uh, with the features like uh, weather details and forecast model coverage and drag and drop and dashboards and all those fancy front end stuff we love to build every day. And uh, we decided that, uh, like, why not? Let's use it in the way how I think uh, we should do it, where instead of taking it and giving it to somebody totally different, we said, let's go full stack. Let's do it that the same team who did the back end will be able to do the front end. And to do so, uh, there's something uh, called uh, Fable, which is amazing thing, which is the compiler that compiles uh, F-sharp to the JavaScript. So then you are able to use React uh, as a view engine, and we did it. And also, if you now have a React, uh, you can use, you know, look at the Stena.js because they have own storybook with the, uh, the JavaScript components. So we just use those components. We just plug them together. Uh, what's amazing uh, about doing full stack is that you can share the logic between server and the client. So there's no nothing like throwing you know, APIs over the fence and say, look, this is the data. And the front end guy say, oh, you send it wrong. Now you have it back. No, you can even share discriminated union in this, in this case, which is pretty, pretty huge. And what I would say was the biggest like proof to our customer was that we just developed it in seven sprints. It was pretty, pretty fast. And thanks, all of it is thanks to the, something which is called uh, Fable Compiler. You can find it on on this uh, on this address. And uh, finally, uh, version four is really, really close to come, and you will be al also able to compile F# -sharp to Python to Rust to Dart, to PHP. Now I saw today actually the working JSX uh, part. So it looks nearly like uh, Java typical TypeScript application on React, but with, of course, a slightly better language. Sorry, I need to say that. And uh, if you want to start with uh, with the uh, like full stack, uh, definitely have a look at something which is already have been on on the F sharp market, I would say for years, it's called safe stack. It's a free .NET template. You just put the uh, .NET new safe and you have full stack F sharp application using React just with my command. So, so it's, it's, it's amazing. It's the best way to start full stack on F sharp. So this is where the weather story ends. This is, I told you nearly, I would say told you everything. So. Now you know all those things I wish I knew two years ago. Now you can uh, go and create your very own weather service. Uh, you can now use all those knowledge how to domain model, how to serialize, how to monitor, store, scale, whatever. Uh, thank you very much. My name is still Roman Provaznik. It was a big pleasure for me to speak here as again, like I'm a big fan of, <laughs> of, uh, of, of uh, Rider and JetBrains. So thanks. Thanks for having me. All right. Uh, that was an awesome talk. You know, it's, uh, it's fascinating, but like the first question I had by the end was like, do you need a hug? Because <laughs> it, it seems you learned a lot through some very either uh, painful or expensive mistakes. So uh, yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, yeah. It was it it was fun. It was fun. I I, I like I like it. Uh, I, I like the learning. You know, I, I always said uh, I have new colleague right now, and he's a little bit scared and afraid. I said like touch everything, like break it. Like who cares? Just just a just a software. Like, and this is the reason why I will never work in uh, for airplane software uh, or for healthcare this is like two two topics i will never get into because <laughs> once about the you know health and people lives i will it's not for me i'm used to learn fast but break things fast so <laughs> yeah you know it's um like you brought up a lot of good points uh, about running azure functions um but you didn't you didn't necessarily talk about maybe some of the pitfalls uh, with F sharp. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about was like cold starts. Uh, do you folks have like a warm up strategy that maybe you learned over time, or is your service just used so often that you don't have to worry about cold startup? Um, when we are thinking about also having API itself for vessels as a, a over Azure Functions, we were trying to do another Azure Function calling the API just to keep it alive. But then it was like, mm, it's it doesn't sound good. It's, it sounds really hacky. So we said, okay, let's use Azure Functions for the background stuff where nobody cares about 12 seconds. And for the customer facing or for the consumer facing API, let's 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 do ASP.NET, which is huge and, and and fast, getting better. I would say every release. So like we are trying to be sensible here, use what what needs to be used for this scenario. So yeah, but otherwise I'm I'm big fan of, of Azure Functions. I I love them, but also we need to say it out loud that that cold starts and stuff like that. It's it's there. Also, the hosts are are weak. I remember the project where we had to switch from the consumption plan to the paid one because of just the hosts were too weak that we are not able to work with many JSONs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, just you need to you need to know your beast. No? I, I mean, in that in regards to you're saying it's weak. Like, what are some of the symptoms folks should look out for when they're noticing? Like, is it timeouts? Um, is it just like, yeah, like what kind of symptoms did you discover to kind of lead you to the idea that like that plan was just way too weak for what you needed to do? I th we were first of all we were not getting any data in application insights a lot. That was that was that was suspicious because I say oh there should be at least some some log somewhere, and then was typical you know log by log by 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 row uh, like typical when you do the front end stuff of course you know source maps but no you will just do console log and you <laughs> read it back so the same same uh, applied here and uh then then we realized that that some really io heavy stuff it, it's it's not good on consumption plan yeah. yeah i've been in that situation where like you have a thousand app services running on one server in azure and then you realize like Oh, I'm running an entire business on a cell phone plan or something. Like that. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Like, oh, yeah. Whoops. Uh, yeah, maybe I should uh, should yeah. adjust that. But Rachel, do you have any thoughts, Kyle, when watching this uh, talk? Uh, yeah, on the the Azure parts. So Cosmos DB, and there were some comments about you know Cosmos DB. Yeah. So Cosmos, why yeah. <laughs> knowing what a what a money sink it could be? Like, what is your strategy for cost savings and why did you choose it? Like, was was there, like, cost, was that the major thing or was there some other reason behind that choice? Um, we already had uh, experience, the one where also I uh, <laughs> created that very expensive instance and nobody nobody found out. Uh, so, so we already we already knew how good it could be and we already had our fingers burned with uh, what to avoid of the, these, these auto scaling stuff and stuff like that. So for us, because of the, the, all the better information, they are small documents by definition and we need to read it fast. We need to write it fast. And also the whole concept of uh, partitions they are pretty good because if you have partition just by the vessel ID, you know that you have those shuffles of data which can be accessed uh, concurrently and, and pretty fast. So we knew that this is really good thing, uh, but uh, 
yeah but then then you just then to be to be honest when you see how more and more vessels jump in and you see the errors on the database you are just always tweaking all the time you uh choke it a little bit on azure function then it appears somewhere else uh, as, as i said you, you for example i had to read all those strategies for uh, producing forecast data for those providers. So I knew one, what's the time and how often it could, could happen and stuff like that. Also, we had to do some backup strategy for, uh, for the API when they ask too often and we need to do the recalculation, stuff like that. So it's really, I would say this is where the fun starts because everything you see, oh, this is so beauty and domain is nice and everything is running. Then you run it will say, oh God, oh, no, <laughs> now there's fixing time. So. It's, I would say it's try, fail, and go again with, with the Cosmos DB. But otherwise, I, I would say I, I like it. I think the strategy for the newcomers in here would be, first of all, I think there's some consumption plan or, or some serverless plan already for, for uh, Cosmos. And for uh, if, if you don't want to go in, into that area, maybe just use the, the lowest point possible and then add it more because if you start from the top you will be paying a lot of money for no reason so mm -hmm. yeah speaking of money you mentioned the application insights um like how how did you decide what kind of sampling rate you needed because you know i think everybody kind of realizes if you want like a hundred percent you get that bill at the end of the month and it's like yeah. oh geez maybe i shouldn't do that <laughs> again i think it was it was something like uh try try fell and see see the pricing uh at the very beginning we were logging a lot because it's a fresh software and you need to know what's going on but when over the time when the necessity of reading data was lowered then we just lowered uh the the, the sampling and and then was that, that that was good. So I would say maybe this is uh, actually the essential of DevOps work. When you write something, you get it to the production, and on those old days, I still remember. You say, "Okay, my job is done. Going for beer, buy." But here, in this more DevOps way, it's actually second job you have. You need to monitor it. You need to think about it. You need to tweak the services. And you constantly update it based on on the load. So mm -hmm. yeah, you need to do. DevOps, yeah, <laughs> I would say. So do you have to ride the boats? And please tell me you have an error message that says, we're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> like you have this uh, in your system somewhere, right? Uh, <laughs> no, but uh, now I'm shame. I, 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 I didn't have it. But uh, funnily, oh, it wasn't funny. It was accident. But uh, I think it was two months ago, This then I had an accident on sea that one vessel was on fire. And... First thing I went, I did was going to the logs and see if they are connected. And I say, oh, oh, it's not our our boat. It's not connected to the service. It's okay. I knew that even if we send them total rubbish, they will not have an accident. But still, you know that you don't want to even remotely involve in problems with uh, vessels on the sea because actually there's nothing more serious than than fire on on the sea. Um, but it, it, it went well, but I need to, I need to, I will send a pull request tomorrow with this error lock. <laughs> this message. Martin said that that story is proper chaos engineering. So that's yeah. <laughs> so you actually have like error messages. Stuff is on fire. Like no, yeah. literally stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. But uh, yeah, otherwise it's, it's fun. You know, I, I think the thing I was watching with that specific data format, you know, the, the matrix and working with vectors of data, like how did you gain that domain knowledge? Are you, are you working with uh, data scientists, nautical engineers, oceanographers? Because when you see that pretty map, it's very easy to like, anybody can read that map. But when you look at that data set, it's just like, oh man, this is overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. Um, luckily, uh, first of all, we had some science guy on the customer side who say, okay, this is how I would propose to do the calculation, interpolation, stuff like that. And this is how we should treat the data, which helped us a lot. Uh, second thing is that I'm totally stupid on math. So uh, I had a really good colleague who was from the mathematical physical faculty. So he did this, his part. So I told him, you know, doing finally so much sharper math, be happy. So uh, <laughs> he did it. And when he was done, I just wrote a good old unit test for me to understand the, how the calculation is done. And then I 
I'm able to reason now back about what how the calculation done, but initially it was that it was his idea and we had to cover it with tests to be explanatory to the rest of the team. But um, it helped a lot that customer also had us someone from this area with with this with this uh, specific knowledge to help us. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, on uh, the uh, ships, do they have? How does internet work? Uh, the most I would know is like from taking a cruise, maybe, and you get kind of crap internet some of the time, and it's super expensive, like even more than Cosmos DB. Yeah. <laughs> so, what? How does this work? Do you? It, does it come in and out of cell range? Do you have to cache stuff? Do you have the intermittent data and sporadic data issues? Yeah, I also learned new thing that there is a very specific exception on ASP.NET when the request is coming so slowly that you get an exception. And I never heard about this exception. I had to really uh, Google it, and then I found a documentation, and also I can set up the the rate of the of the request of the byte rate, how how fast it should go until it's terminated. So yeah, there was again some this kind of scenarios when the vessel is an area in area which is not really good covered, and of course we have some typical caching uh, on on the API level. It it, it depends. Uh, it's it's uh, it's good when you do it that you have like query and common side and you have it split it. But the fun starts when something on background changes and Wessel don't know yet and start asking. So it's then, then it's getting more uh, again more, more fun. But yeah, uh, I learned a lot about about the slow connections from from the Wessel, and uh, that's that's how it is. Like just you just need to again tweak it a little bit to, to be working. If it fails, they ask a little bit later. So again, like be prepared. I think it's it's good, and it goes to the previous talk about the chaos everywhere. Is that uh, things fails, and again, uh, another thing is that we are so obsessed as a developers, you know, with everything must be, uh, you know, the asset, everything must be now and in current state. But whole world is totally unsynchronized, there's no current state of anything. So if you embrace the fact that, first of all, if you ask, nobody will reply back sometimes. If you ask about what's the state, you need to also ask like, when do you exactly, like what's the state now or state after 10 seconds? Like you need to, I think when you as a software developer, and it's pretty difficult because we are taught in high schools and universities, totally different stuff that, you need to embrace the uncertainty, the failure, the that word works totally different. But if you get into it, you say you are totally free. You you can you can just the only thing you do as a software developer you lower the level of erroneness to some reasonable way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, Rachel has a really interesting question. I just saw her type. So, Rachel, <laughs> you're asking that question. I am not asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> Any boats in the fleet named Bodie McBoatface by chance? If <laughs> 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 anybody doesn't know what that is, a bunch no, of no. folks in the UK voted to name a boat that <laughs> like what a couple of years ago. <laughs> no, I think the boats are named pretty, I would say it's pretty boring, like Scandinavica, Germanica. I, I don't know what, how was how would they do it uh, in the Stena, it's a Swedish company, so they have some different some rule behind but mm -hmm. uh we will we need to wait uh, some time to get some nice names behind the whistles i mean speaking of the boats though it's like how how do you folks test for those kind of like open sea conditions because do you have like a test lab or do you just go in uh jacob in our previous talk was had just config settings for latency and kind of buffering that into uh the app right so how do how do you folks test for those open sea conditions? Um, actually, the first testing phase was that it was running on the vessel, but uh, uh, the, it it uh, didn't affect uh, the system itself. It was still totally sailed by nautical officers, and mm -hmm. uh, they during the trip because it's it's like in an airplane, it's semi automatic anyway. They okay. were looking at the data and compare it with what they have from the Ender system, from the old one, and they say, okay, this looks about right, this looks about wrong. Also, they uh, want to be able to put in their own data because they are on the west, they, they know what the weather is, they can look from the window. So uh, mm -hmm. 
So they did the validation when we start. It was really, I think, one of two, or maybe, maybe more sailings and just looking at the data if, if they are working correctly and if they are coming in good rate and stuff like that. So yeah. it was really like testing on C. Like yeah. you cannot really, I think, do it in more different way than just test in sort of production. So yeah. Well, you know, a lot of startups now are kind of letting their developers do like a day of service to kind of see how people using their software experience it. So I'm hoping you get to actually uh, sail one of these boats sometime. Just so, just yeah, I've been there. I've been there. Not not really sailing, but uh, luckily it was like two. Uh, it was in September, beginning of the September. I've been to Gothenburg, where the Stena uh, is had a headquarters. Mm -hmm. And the product owner said, oh, I finally see you in person after more than two years because we were over uh, during COVID and say, oh, here's the Vessel Germanica here. And do you want to see the Captain's Bridge? I say, oh, yes. So I That's saw awesome. the software itself running. So I say it's now consuming our data. So it's good feeling to see the impact, something you, you, you help to build uh, directly on the Vessel. Also, it was first time. Uh, getting to do to the nautical officer's bridge, you need to go through some security check. It was like when you get to the cockpit uh, in an airplane, and yeah. it was it was pretty awesome to to see it. But still, like I, for my bucket list, I need to check out the real sailing and seeing it live. But I'm afraid they won't let me during the sailing from from security reasons. They won't let me in mm. uh, during sailing. But uh, but yeah, yeah still you, you, you seem like a trustworthy person. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know you. what issues they have, but uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> on, the, on that note, that was a great talk. Uh, it's great seeing F sharp in production having a real world impact. So thank you. Thank, uh, you. thank you for sharing your lessons. And uh, yeah, we're gonna keep on this F sharp boat uh, with our next speaker. So uh, again, thank you so much, Ramon, and uh, you're welcome to come back anytime. So thank, thank you very much. It was a yeah. big pleasure for me. Thank yeah. you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.